As the sun dipped low on the horizon, painting the sky with hues of red and gold, the distant silhouette of Troy emerged, a dark shadow against the fading light. The young warlord Achilles stood at the helm of his ship, the sea breeze ruffling his golden hair and the salty air filling his nostrils. His polished armor gleamed bronze, catching the sunlight in a dazzling display of power and prestige. His helmet, adorned with a majestic horsehair plume, cast a shadow over his face, leaving only his piercing eyes exposed. They burned in anticipation of the impending war, the clash of bronze against bronze, and the blood-soaked soil that awaited. Around him, the Greek armada stretched as far as the eye could see, a formidable force of warships, each carrying fearless warriors eager for glory. Among them were Agamemnon, the commander of the armada, and his younger brother Menelaus, king of Sparta, whose stolen wife, Helen, had ignited the flames of this epic conflict. Menelaus stood amid his men with his gaze fixed upon the towering city, his red hair glowing like a crown of flames, eager to regain his stolen honor. He was unaware that the siege of Troy would last ten long years, and it would be 18 years before he saw the shores of his home again. The conflict which would ensue outside of the walls of the Bronze Age city of Troy would provide the material for the epic poem which would shape the very foundation of Western civilization, Homer's Iliad. Just as the Bible provided a unifying and founding text for the Israelites, which allowed them to form their identity in a shared history, the Trojan War, as recounted in Homer's Iliad, would become an identity-defining reference point for the Greeks and the many Western peoples which followed. For the Greeks, the Iliad provided a contrast between West and East, between us and them, and a pantheon of heroes in whom they found kinship and from whom they claimed divine descent. In many ways, the Trojan War was the first event in Western historical consciousness and it would go on to frame the history of the West for thousands of years to come. From the Greco-Persian Wars and Alexander the Great's conquest of Asia, to the Frankish and Aquitanian repulsion of the Muslim forces in the Battle of Tor. On the plains of Troy and in the poetry of Homer, the spirit of the West was born. More than 3,000 years after the events of Homer's Iliad, in the waning light of a Turkish spring day in 1873, a man named Heinrich Schliemann stood on the windswept plains near the Aegean coast. His eyes were set on a mound of earth which he believed concealed the ancient city of Troy. Heinrich Schliemann was not a traditional archaeologist. He was a self-made millionaire who had amassed his fortune through various business ventures yet his heart belonged to the study of the ancient world, and his mind was consumed by a singular vision, the discovery of the lost city of Troy. At the age of just seven, Schliemann had declared that he was going to discover and excavate Troy, and it had been his determination to do so ever since. Schliemann meticulously studied ancient texts, maps, and geographical descriptions to determine the most likely location for the city of Troy. He eventually settled on Hisarlik, a hill in modern-day Turkey, as his chosen excavation site. Though his efforts were met with skepticism from the academic establishment, who dismissed his theories as flights of fancy, in March of 1871, Schliemann began his excavations. After weeks of backbreaking labor, Schliemann's pickaxe struck something hard beneath the earth. As the dirt and debris fell away, the outline of a massive stone structure emerged, a defensive wall built layer upon layer over centuries. As Schliemann dug deeper into the layers of his Sarlik, he uncovered evidence that he believed corresponded with the descriptions in the Iliad. Fortifications, gates, and walls were revealed, and burnt debris and weaponry suggested a city that had endured a violent conflict. As he continued to excavate, Schliemann discovered a hoard of gold and silver artifacts, which he referred to as Prime's treasure. This cache of precious objects, including jewelry, vases, and a diadem, which Schliemann dubbed the Jewels of Helen, captured the imagination of the public. 
Soon, headlines read that Schliemann had discovered the lost city of Troy. Over the next 20 years, Schliemann conducted a series of excavations at Hisarlik, revealing the city's ancient layers one by one. Schliemann's work led to the identification of nine distinct layers, each reflecting a different era of the city's existence. Schliemann would also conduct other digs in Greece, uncovering the funeral shafts at Mycenae, and in them, the golden funeral mask which he famously called the Mask of Agamemnon. Thanks to the dream which had gripped Schliemann as a boy, the lost city of Troy, once thought to be the stuff of myth and legend, had been resurrected from the sands of time. But even more important than the discovery of the actual city was the proof that the myths and legends of the Greeks, once thought to be pure fiction, were based upon historical fact. The historical reality of the Trojan War was still up for debate. However, this would change after the translation of Hittite records attesting the Trojan War. The Hittites were an ancient Anatolian people who established a powerful kingdom centered in modern-day Turkey during the Late Bronze Age. The most crucial Hittite records related to the Trojan War come in the form of a diplomatic correspondence known as the Ahiyawa Letters. The term Ahiyawa is believed to correspond to the very same Achaeans or Mycenaeans who laid siege to Troy in the pages of the Iliad. The Ahiyawa letters contain references to various political and diplomatic exchanges between the Hittite Empire and the Ahiyawa state. They discuss matters such as the release of prisoners, disputes over territory, and requests for military assistance. The Hittites also mention interactions with a land called Wilusa, which many scholars believe to be an Anatolian rendering of Ilios or Ilium, the ancient name for Troy. One of the most intriguing Hittite records is the Tawagalawa letter, which contains a reference to a figure named Tawagalawa, who has been linked by some scholars to the Greek figure Ateocles, a name mentioned in the Iliad. The Hittite records when considered in conjunction with the other archaeological findings and ancient texts, contribute to the growing body of evidence which suggests that the events of the Iliad, though perhaps embellished, did in fact take place in the Late Bronze Age. As the prow of Brutus's ship cleaved through the waves, the salt-laden winds carried whispers of destiny. The land that stretched before him was unlike any he had ever seen, a land of rugged cliffs and emerald hills, cloaked in fog. Once, Brutus's great-grandfather, Aeneas, had taken to the sea in search of a new home for his people, as his city, Troy, burned behind him. According to Virgil, he would find this home on the Italian peninsula, and unite the Latin and Trojan peoples, giving birth to the Roman bloodline. But the young explorer Brutus had his eyes set on even remoter lands. As he took the first step on unfamiliar soil, and damp fog kissed his cheeks, he knew what he would call this strange new continent. He would name it Britain. The legend of Brutus of Troy gained prominence in medieval England, thanks in large part to Geoffrey of Monmouth's The History of the Kings of Britain. This influential work narrated the mythical origins of Britain, asserting that Brutus, the great-grandson of Aeneas, had founded the island. The myth of Brutus provided a captivating origin story for British royalty. Medieval monarchs, including King Arthur, were often depicted as descendants of Brutus. Among the noble families who claimed descent from the heroes of Troy was the House of Troyes in France, who traced their ancestry back to Aeneas through his son Ascanius, as well as the House of Stuart in Scotland, whose claim rested on the belief that Banquo, a legendary Scottish king mentioned in Shakespeare's Macbeth, was a descendant of the Trojan hero Brutus. Modern scholars have questioned the historical accuracy of these narratives, and yet before Heinrich Schliemann, no serious historian would have dared to assert that Homer's Iliad contained within it as much historical fact as myth. Although it may seem unlikely that a genetic connection existed between the Trojans and the aristocratic lineages of medieval Europe, the influence of the Iliad on medieval European culture is undeniable. 
Just as the ancient Greeks had, they traced their lineages back to the heroes who fought at Troy. In medieval chivalric literature, Achilles served as the quintessential example of valor and martial prowess. Knights and heroes aspired to emulate his unmatched courage on the battlefield. In the mind of the medieval European, the Trojan War and the heroism of Achilles were still fresh. The Iliad is the oldest text to mention Achilles. Greek myth tells us that Achilles was born to the goddess Thetis and the mortal Peleus, making Achilles a demigod. Zeus had been pursuing Thetis, but after coming to learn of a prophecy that any son born to Thetis would surpass his father, Zeus married her off to the mortal king Peleus. The story of Achilles gaining invulnerability after being dipped in the river Styx was a later invention, first mentioned in Statius' Achilliad, written in the 1st century AD. Yet in the Iliad, Achilles' semi-divine nature makes him nearly invincible. In the opening lines of the epic, Achilles is described as Dios Achilleos, the Greek Dios meaning divine or godlike, sometimes translated more literally as shining or brilliant. In Book 1 of the Iliad, Agamemnon, the leader of the Achaeans, seizes Briseis, a young woman given to Achilles as a war prize. To take vengeance on the Achaeans for his wounded pride, Achilles departs from the war effort to sulk by his tent. Without their best fighter, the war soon turns in favor of the Trojans, and a despairing Agamemnon sends Odysseus, Telamonian Ajax, and Phoenix to appease Achilles and beg him to rejoin the fight. Achilles rejects the prizes which Agamemnon offers him, saying, Cattle and fat sheep can all be had from the raiding, tripods all for the trading, and tawny-headed stallions, but a man's life breath cannot come back again. No raiders in force, no trading brings it back, once it slips through a man's clenched teeth. Mother tells me, the immortal goddess Thetis with her glistening feet, that two fates bear me on to the day of death. If I hold out here and I lay siege to Troy, my journey home is gone, but my glory never dies. If I journey back to the fatherland I love, my pride, my glory dies. True. But the life that's left me will be long. The stroke of death will not come upon me quickly. Achilles says that he will return home, choosing the second option, and urges his fellow Achaeans to do the same. Since Achilles will not join the fight, his dear companion Patroclus puts on his armor, hoping to strike fear into the Trojans and drive them back. But the inferior fighter is killed by the Trojan Hector. Patroclus' death forces Achilles to confront his own mortality, and sets off a chain of events which ultimately lead to Achilles' death. Achilles' mother visits him as he sits sorrow-stricken on the beach. Thetis answered, warning through her tears, You are doomed to a short life, my son, from all you say, for hard on the heels of Hector's death, your death must come at once. Then let me die at once, Achilles burst out, despairing, since it was not my fate to save my dearest comrade from his death. Achilles' desire to avenge Patroclus' death by killing Hector causes him to reverse his earlier position on his fate. Mourning Patroclus, Achilles refuses to eat and drink with the other Achaeans as they feast in preparation for the next day of fighting. Achilles' fast acts as a ritual of mourning, but also serves as a symbolic defiance of death. By refusing to eat, Achilles is rejecting the fact that he must rely on food and drink to keep him alive. Thus, Achilles seeks to resist the weakness which makes him mortal. Yet looking down from Olympus upon the mourning Achilles, Zeus sends Athena to nourish him with the food of the immortal gods. Achilles' consumption of nectar and ambrosia marks his entry into a godlike state. With his body strengthened and clad in the armor which Hephaestus forged for him, Achilles embarks on a partial and temporary ascension to godhood. Achilles now, like in human fire, raging on through the mountain gorges, splinter dry, setting ablaze big stands of timber, 
the wind swirling the fireball left and right, chaos of fire. Achilles storming on, brandishing spear like a frenzied god of battle, trampling all he killed, and the earth ran black with blood. Achilles is often described as godlike, but here he is described as equal to a god, translated more liberally by Fagels as like a frenzied god of battle. By eating of the food of the gods, Achilles temporarily becomes like the gods. Achilles' physical ascension towards godhood is accompanied by a total loss of mercy. Achilles has no regard for the lives of mortals, or the laws of common companionship and brotherhood with man. When Lycaon, one of Priam's sons, throws himself before Achilles and begs for his life, Achilles kills the unarmed man without remorse. As Achilles tosses Lycaon's lifeless body into the river, he says, Make your bed with the fishes now. They'll dress your wound and lick it clean of blood, so much for your last rites. Nor will your mother lay your corpse on a bier and mourn her darling son. Die, Trojans, die, till I butcher all the way to sacred Troy. Run headlong on, I'll hack you from behind. Nothing can save you now. Achilles' power has grown so great that even after the gods who live forever have returned to Olympus, Achilles slaughters on and on, never pausing. At last, only Hector, the great hero of Troy, stands in its defense. Achilles engages Hector in single combat, and, using his knowledge of the slain Patroclus' armor, which Hector is wearing, Achilles pierces Hector through the neck. Hector, immobilized in the dust, begs for mercy, but Achilles replies, There are no pacts between lions and men. No friendship between wolves and lambs. Once Achilles has avenged Patroclus' death by killing Hector, and thus also sealed his own fate, he eats and drinks with the other Achaeans. For Achilles, this marks a return to a state of mortality. Yet Achilles is still resisting his mortality by refusing to bathe himself or bury Patroclus. When Achilles gives in to sleep for the first time since Patroclus' death, the ghost of Patroclus visits him saying, Sleeping, Achilles, you've forgotten me, my friend. You never neglected me in life, now only in death. Bury me, quickly, let me pass the gates of Hades. Never, never again will you and I, alive and breathing, huddle side by side apart from loyal comrades, making plans together. Never, grim death, that death assigned from the day that I was born has spread its hateful jaws to take me down. And you too, your fate awaits you too, godlike as you are, Achilles, to die in battle beneath the proud, rich Trojans' walls. But one thing more, a last request. Grant it, please. Never bury my bones apart from yours. Achilles, let them lie together. By agreeing to bury Patroclus' bones alongside his own and allowing Patroclus to pass into Hades, Achilles accepts Patroclus' death and resigns himself to his own mortality. The story of Achilles would inspire generations of Western men, including Alexander the Great, who slept with a copy of the Iliad under his pillow and would dedicate his life to following in Achilles' footsteps. With the superhuman deeds of a young king who set out thousands of years ago upon the waves of the Aegean in search of glory and riches in foreign lands, the spirit of the West was born. And in the pages of Homer's Iliad, this spirit and the bloody, glorious struggle which forged it would be immortalized forever.